Hello. Is it possible that people have an excuse for being lawless or sinners by lying, stealing, raping, murdering, and by breaking the universal laws of love or the Ten Commandments in general because they don't have the scriptures to read? Or do they have a free ticket to sin because they haven't heard about the Messiah? Uninformed teachers teach that Adam and Eve or Chua broke Yahuwah's universal laws because they didn't have a written set of laws back then. And some teach that the world was destroyed because men were lawless due to not having a written law to read until Moses came. Can this all be true? These type teachings cause many folks to wonder, is this why the scriptures came along in the first place? And were we given instructions that were impossible for us to obey? The truth is, Yahuwah's universal laws were implemented during creation and are and have been written in nature from the beginning of time. Yahuwah used his universal laws to create humans and wrote or attached them in our DNA or minds which are better known as our moral compass or conscience. After freeing the children of Israel from bondage, Yahuwah saw the need to write these universal laws of love upon stone tablets and commanded his people to laboriously carry them around with him in the Ark of the Covenant carry them around with them in the Ark of the Covenant as a reminder to keep them. In due time, the Torah, or universal laws of love, were incarnated and Yahushua Mashiach appeared as the perfect embodiment of the truth, which he became the living on how to live a perfect, sinless life by simply obeying the Torah. So he became our living example on how to live a perfect, sinless life by simply obeying the Torah. Eventually, the scriptures were collected and canonized by men giving us a larger and easier accessibility to a more complete edition of Yahuwah's laws and right rulings. In Yahuwah's divine wisdom, it was His will that we would again have the law written in our DNA. But this time, it would finally be written in the hearts of men, not on stone tablets or in their conscience. And his indwelling would help and ensure that men would obey and display the universal law of love in their outward lives as he describes as good fruits in his word of truth. Starting with Moses, the Torah was given on stone tablets. And through the prophets, Yahuwah's universal laws became written down on scrolls and were called scripture or the Tanakh. These writings on scrolls are better known to us as the original manuscripts or the autographed writings. In the beginning, The laws, or the universal laws of love, or Yahuwah's commands, were written in nature. And we found that we can find 
this in Psalms 19, 1. It says, The Shemayim, or heavens or skies, are proclaiming the esteem of all, and space is declaring the work of his hand. And then, as he created us, he gave us our moral compass, or he wrote his laws into our conscious, into our conscious or subconscious mind. We can look that up in Romans 2, 15. It says, for when nations who do not have the Torah by instinct do what is in the Torah, although not having the Torah, they are a Torah to themselves. Who show the work of the Torah written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or even excusing. In the day when Yahuwah shall judge the secrets of men through Yahusha Mashiach, according to the Basora. So here we can see that the Torah is written in your conscious mind. So then, I guess that wasn't good enough. So when he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage, he gave them his Torah on written on tablets of stones. And we read about that in Exodus. Exodus 24, 12 says, And Yahuwah said to Moja, or Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there while I give you tablets of stone and the Torah and the command which I have written to teach them. So here's the beginning of the laws or universal laws of love of Yahuwah being written down in a language given to men to study and to read. And they were first written on tablets of stone and given to Moses. And then we can move on to the Messiah, who was the illustrated edition, if you will, of the law. So if we go to John 14. We can read, And the Word became flesh, and pitched his tent among us, and we saw his esteem, esteem as of and only begotten of the Father, complete in favor and truth. So here we have a man walking among us, who not only knows all the laws, but is obeying all the laws perfectly. And he will become our Messiah or our Deliverer. Then, as time goes on, the entire scriptures, including the Tanakh, uh, the testimony of Yahusha, the memoirs of the first followers are all gathered together by man and canonized into a one book for easy access for people to read and learn about the laws of the universe or laws of Yahuwah or his universal laws of love. 
So they're all put into one place, as far as we know or can tell. And we can read about that in Romans 15, 4. We go to that, we read, For whatever was written before was written for our instruction, that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures we might have the expectation. So here we find that everything, all the laws, are gathered into one place and given to us. So then, we go to Hebrews 8, and we find out that not only are we giving all the laws and understandings of the right rulings in one place called scriptures, but he's now going to write them inside of us again, but this time, instead of in our conscious mind, he's going to inscribe them on our hearts. So he's going to circumcise our hearts of stone and give us hearts of flesh and write them inside there. So Hebrews 8.10 says, Because this is the covenant that I shall make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahuwah, given my laws in their mind, and I shall write them on their hearts, and I shall be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. So not only now do we have them written in our minds, in our conscience, but also inscribed in our hearts, and written down together on words that we can read and study. All this together combined in the divine wisdom of Yahuwah will re should reflect on the outward believer's life and should show up as good fruits as Yahuwah calls it. And if we go to 2 Corinthians 3, verses 2 and 3, we read, Are we to begin to recommend ourselves again? Or do we need as some letters of recommendation to you or from you? You are our letter having been written in our hearts, known and read by all men, making it obvious that you are a letter of Mashiach served by us, written not with ink, but by the Ruach of the loving Yahuwah, not on tablets of stone, but on fleshly tablets of the heart. And such trust we have toward Yahuwah through the Mashiach, So now, we have them written in our conscious mind, on our hearts, on down on paper that we can read and study by, and the results are that our outward life reflects His law of love, and we love Him, and we love our neighbors, and we produce good fruit. So we're a walking letter to ourselves, uh, and evidence that everybody that sees us can tell that we are with Elohim, and we are being lawful. So, this all leads up to what we're going to be learning on this study, hopefully, and that is more about the natural law, the written law, the conscious law, and how to uh, 
get around in scriptures. So let's, without any further ado, let's try to get into the meat of it. The original manuscripts range in time from around 1500 BC and continue through 100 AD. The original manuscripts. Each copy was written by hand, and every time a scroll started wearing out, or was lost, or tore up, or rained on, or whatever, uh, a new copy would be duplicated by handwriting through a new scribe with new interpretations of the word. There was a very slow, this was a very slow and laborious task to say the least. Under the harsh living conditions of ancient societies, many written works were lost and destroyed. This is one of the reasons we probably do not have any copies of the original manuscripts with us today. Life would be so much easier if we only had the original manuscripts because no one could argue or debate the truth written within the original scrolls because they are in fact inspired, not translations by biased or overzealous scribes. So then it becomes quite clear that we must only have early copies of the original text with us then. But how early? How close to the original manuscripts are they? Well, the earliest copies known to man are known as Codex. They are Codex Sinaiticus written in Greek about 330 A.D. You got the Codex Vaticanus, which was written in Latin around 340 A.D. And the Codex Alexandrius, uh, also written in Greek around 425 A.D. That's the oldest stuff we've got. Um, and it's, it's also important to know that the Latin Vulgate was first written in 400 A.D. So this means that Jerome of Bethlehem, when he translated the Vulgate, had to use either codexes, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus or one of the other ancient copies or versions that were known to exist at that time, such as the Septuagint version of the Hebrew Tanakh, written in Greek, which dates around 285 BC, or the Samaritan version, which is written in Hebrew, or the Samaritan characters, some call it, or the Syriac version written in common Aramaic. Um, so basically a quick history of scriptures was the original manuscripts written from 1500 B.C. to 180. They're all gone. They're lost. We don't know of any existence of any of them, as far as we know. From them came early copies. And those are the codexes that we just mentioned. Then we have the ancient copies the ancient versions or of those copies and then the Latin Vulgate right 400 AD from there it was over a thousand years went by before anything else was ever attempted to be copied 
and between that time period was the Dark Ages, the Crusades, uh, which wiped out just about anything written in Hebrew. And this is where the big misconception comes in that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and the New Testament was written in Greek because basically it's all we've got. We do have one original copy of the book of Matthew written in Hebrew still in existence and some other stuff, but basically uh, the Crusades took care of that for us. I mean, totally eradicated the Hebrew literature. So anyways, a thousand years, over a thousand years, all of a sudden Wycliffe surfaces, starts trying, uh, you know, into German, translating into Greek and the Latin Vulgate into German, and then Tyndale comes in trying to, you know, do the, starting the English translation, and then Cloverleaf, and then the Matthews, and then Great, the Great Translation, and then the Geneva comes in at 1560 AD, and then off of that's the bishops, uh, Dua, Dewey, uh, the James, the King James English translation version, uh, the authorized version, uh, 1611. Um, that was basically come off of the Latin Vulgate, which they deny, but it did. It has a lot of a lot of resemblance to the Latin Vulgate. And it uh, uh, also had the Procrypha uh, uh, written in it in originally as well. Uh, then the revised version, 1881 of the King James, but between 1611 and 1881, there was a lot of different, uh, you know, remakes or revisions, modifications. To the original King James, uh, even the you know, one they call the adulterous edition, where uh, in the Ten Commandments it said that you you shall commit adultery. Uh, but uh, the main revised version came in 1881, and then the American Standard 1901, and then after that. Everything kind of cooled off until the 50s, and then in 1952, the RSV came out. 1959, the Berkeley version came out. Then the Amplified in 1965, the JB in 66, the NEB in 1970, the NASB in 1971, the LB uh, 1971. And then uh, the TEB in 1976, the NIV in 1978, and the New King James Version first came out in 1982. And most of these modern English translations uh, supposedly came from uh, the King James uh, the early copies of all the codexes along with the Dead Sea Scrolls and other newly discovered manuscripts in the modern era. And so that's the history of the, of the scriptures. Um, the, the Apocrypha uh, like I said, was originally in the King James 1611. Uh, it's still in the Latin Vulgate, at least most of them are. I think there's seven or eight books still in the Latin Vulgate out of the 15. Um, so they've been in and out, in and out, in and out uh, throughout the history. And so it's, I suppose it's up to you if you want to um, read those and uh, uh, use and you know use them as, as, as 
it's inspired or uh, some kind of divine revelation writings or whatever you want to think of them I guess that's up to you but I find them to be very interesting and educational myself and they do interlock or uh, into the uh, uh, modern English translations we have and there's mentions of them by Yahusha himself including the book of Enoch and so forth and so on so you can go ahead and study all that on your own uh, if you'd like now uh, like I said after the translation of the Latin Vulgate uh, it would be over a thousand years uh, spanning the Dark Ages and suffering the Crusades and genocide and er, uh, eradication of everything Jew before we would see any other translation of scriptures. So during the, the Crusades uh, or the Dark Ages almost all the Hebrew literature, history, and culture were destroyed. They did this in an attempt to totally wipe away or erase the memory of Israel and the Israelites off the face of the earth. They totally tried to replace them. Even the promised land was stripped from the Jews and they were ran out of there. And sadly, even Israel, the nation Israel, and and Israel's Elohim was renamed to try to hide and eradicate them from the face of the earth. They actually named the prom renamed the promised land Palestine and renamed Yahuwah Jehovah and started calling him up by pagan devices such as G-O-D and L-O-R-D. Uh, Basically, like I said, starting in the 4th century and climaxing in the 17th century with the authorized English version of 1611, an evolution of the sacred writings from the prophets who were inspired to write the Texas by Yahuwah to the many present-day printed copies much bias and tampering and misinterpretations have taken place. Many scribes and theologians have twisted and bent the scriptures in hopes of influencing the laity into agreeing with their personal interpretations or doctrines. Many modern day scholars and theologians do acknowledge and fully understand that there are many errors and changes that have happened over the ages to scripture both intentionally and intentionally I mean uh, both intentionally and non-intentionally uh, mostly some of it was done out of ignorance related to the Hebrew language um, but sadly these uh, scholars that know have learned truth in their modern times they're still choosing to remain silent on truth and, and remain covering up the truth and, and uh, maintaining spreading the lies. Especially since the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, there is no excuse for them to remain stubborn and rebellious. And this lends to one's imagination as to why they will not admit to these obvious errors in common translations and the practice of false religions being taught in Christianity especially. The teaching and celebrating of pagan holy days 
and objects of worship such as steeples, bells, crosses, pillars, and pews need to be eradicated. The use of replacement words and names such as Easter, Sunday, uh, Sunday worshiping, cross worshiping, cross, church, Lord, Jesus, God, and many other vices should cease and desist immediately. Most recently, we now have some new translations that are using a paleo Hebrew format as a precursor and attempt to offer believers a more accurate translation and then retrospect a more accurate copy of scripture. This attempt to restore the scriptural words and names back as close to the original Hebrew as possible is nothing short of remarkable and is the honorable thing to do. There is an awakening taking place for anyone who honestly loves and seeks out the truth. Ever since the awakening of the Nazarene, many English translations known as BYNV, Cipher, Hallelujah Scriptures, ISR, and more have become readily available for all truth seekers known as the Hebrew Roots Movement. So, quickly, another thing I'd like to um, go over with you is that uh, when you're reading scriptures, especially what they call the New Testament, but it also applies to the to the uh, Old Testament, is um, it's a good idea to try to get a better understanding of just what you're starting to read. Um, instead of cherry picking verses out of each letter or epistle or book and trying to put together a, a doctrine of some sort, um, it's not a good idea. So the better uh, way of doing that would be um, just use the book of James or Yaku, you know, as an example. Um, so the best way to before we would begin to study the book of James or Yaqub would be to um, you know see who the author is who who wrote it and the date he wrote it um, who he wrote it to who was the original audience I mean you can make notes of this stuff let's do a little bit of studying um, and then What's the theme, the key themes or the mega theme behind the book or the letter? Most of the stuff written in the New Testament are either epistles or letters written from someone to somebody or a group of people to another group of people or they're the memoirs of the first followers of Yahushua and they were writing down what they remember about their, uh, their when they were walking with him and a relationship with him while he was uh, alive and walking on the earth as a man. Uh, it's also a good idea to try to find out what the main purpose or the occasion of the letter is. Um, the synopsis, synopsis or the outline, is there a, well, how many topics are there? Is he sticking to, the writer sticking to one topic, or is there, is he going to two or three different topics and back to the big first one? You know, with what's going on there. Uh, it's also a good idea to try to find out who the key people are. And in other words, who's writing it, and who's, who's receiving it, and who are, they, who are they talking about? Who's the key people? mentioned in the letter. Um, is there a special message or a featured presentation involved in the letter or the book? Um, 
So as you start going down through them, um, you will find that you, especially Paul's letters, um, almost all of them are letters. So you're gonna, you're gonna originally, you're gonna find the greeting or the uh, salutation or and thanksgiving in the beginning, and then generally it'll it'll mention the original audience or the person to whom the letter is being written to. Uh, and that's in the beginning and then as you go down through there then you generally you'll find the theme or the purpose of the letter you know what what the uh, subject matter is and then toward the end of the last chapter or the second of the last chapter or usually the last there'll be a conclusion or a, con a concluding admonition or closing thoughts Sometimes they'll sum up the entire uh, purpose of the letter in their conclusion right at the end of the last chapter. And uh, then usually at the very end, there'll be a final greeting and a vindication, vindiction or a prayer. And then sometimes you'll find a closing salutation at the very end. So, this is the sort of the things that you need to uh, kind of understand as you're reading through there so you don't get mixed messages. And like I said, cherry picking is totally one way of not knowing, understanding what you're reading. You got to read everything in context. Best thing to do is read the entire letter from chapter one to the end in context. Yeah, and keeping all that stuff in mind that we just talked about. Uh, but definitely at the at the least, read the entire chapter. You know, everybody wants to jump around and burst, burst, to burst, to burst, to burst, to burst, chapter verse, did you know, but this is how you we can get the mixed uh, mixed message. So at the least, read the whole entire chapter in context, but you should read the entire letter. And over and over and over again to understand what he's, where he's coming from. So an example that we're using here is in James. So basically in the, in the letter of James, uh, to use the example we just went over, uh, we look to see who the author is, who wrote it. So we know the author was James or Yaqub, really, that's who it was. And he, who was he? Well, he was Yahusha's brother or half-brother. And he was a leader in the Jerusalem assembly, one of the elders, or maybe the highest elder. Uh, in some cases, it seems that he was. Um, so what date was it written? Well, probably around 49 A.D. And uh, prior to the Jerusalem Council held in A.D. 50, so just before, uh, you know, Paul and all of them came in there and they had that big council meeting about Gentiles. Um, so who was the original audience? Who did he write it to? Who was the recipient? Uh, basically, it was written in general to the first century uh, Nazarene, really, or the, or the Jewish assemblies or Jewish people residing in uh, Gentile nations or communities outside of Israel, so in dispersia. That's who he was really addressing it to. So it wasn't to anybody, uh, you know, specific. And then what was the purpose of the letter? Um, his purpose was to expose the hypocrisy, um, the practices, and to teach uh, the correct Nazarene behavior or lifestyle. Um, And the setting of the letter, um, 
expresses James or Yakub's concern for persecuted uh, believers who were once part of the Jerusalem assembly. You know, they were being persecuted um, outside uh, into the, uh, in the other nations. So that this was the purpose of the letter and the, and the mega theme of it was basically uh, uh, someone will say you have a belief and I say I have deeds. Show me your belief without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do, by my works. You know, so uh, he was basically debunking the all you have to do is believe in the atonement sacrifice of the Messiah and and uh, that's all you got to do and, uh, and you go about being lawless and doing whatever you want and he was basically attacking that situ that uh, misconception that was the main mega theme of the letter all right so that's what you kind of do there And uh, let's move on. We're going to run out of time. But uh, the book of Romans, okay, uh, amazingly depicts the evolution of the divine law. Uh, by categorizing them into three witnesses um, that actually testified to Allahim's existence. In this handwritten correspondence, Paul carefully establishes the breaking or observing of the universal law of love as the accountability of human guilt to Allahim. The three witnesses that gives testimony against mankind's breaking of Yahusha's universal laws of love and truth, which is sin, and, and give witness to Elohim's existence are, one, creation or, or nature, two, our moral compass or conscience, and three, the written scriptures or Tanakh, which means Torah of Moses and prophets and writings. And in our modern era, this would include the testimony of Yahushua, who will inscribe his universal laws of love or commands on your heart, not on stone, after your conversion and immersion in water. And the memoirs of the first century followers also give witness. Truly, folks, mankind has no excuse for practicing lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness, meaning without Torah, the lawless will be cast into the outer darkness and there will be weeping and gnashing of the teeth, people. Paul reveals just how much Elohim, or our Creator, has made himself known to his creation. Creation implies a Creator. The moral law implies a moral lawgiver. In the modern day, written scriptures is still able to win people over on its own merit as it has done throughout its written history. <clears throat> Anyone <clears throat> of these three witnesses of the truth written about by Paul and Romans can be useful in conversations with unbelievers. Paul gave us some thoughtful reflection about these three witnesses and we also shouldn't hesitate to boldly use these three witnesses to testify about the truth of Elohim to those who need to know him. Specifically speaking, uh, the book of Romans may be written to existing believers as can be seen in the salutation to all whom are in Rome, beloved of Yahuwah, called set apart. But the section um, from the middle of chapter 1 to the middle of chapter 3 serves to establish the existence of a creator through universal laws 
and guilt of the unbelieving humans, and they will be held accountable without excuse to Elohim. Paul relates that outside of Yahusha and of the Torah, we are all sinners. But even if we don't know Yahusha or the Torah, we are still without excuse for our sin, because we ought to have known better. Paul clearly teaches us that the three witnesses that testify to the truth was designed by Yahuwah for the purpose that the whole world may be held accountable to Elohim on the day of judgment. They serve as powerful witnesses for the existence of Elohim. In Romans chapter 1 verse 18, Paul identifies unrighteousness as the unbelievers that are suppressing the truth. In verses 19 and 20, he clarifies that the truth that they are suppressing is who Yahuwah is, and they deny his divine power and nature. In other words, Paul is saying that creation itself clearly and plainly testifies to a creator. Again, Paul's main point is that the simple testimony of Elohim's existence through creation makes it so that men are without excuse for suppressing the truth because they knew Yahuwah and suppressed the knowledge anyway that they have been given of Elohim, or given by Elohim, through nature and creation, although they may not have the written Torah. They are also without excuse for acting in such a way that goes against what Yahuwah has made self-evident in his creation, such as males and females and mathematics. In fact, we know of 7 to 12 universal laws that do exist. Some of them are, you know, the law of vibration, the law of rel relativity, the law of cause and effect, the law of polarity, the law of gestation, uh, the law of rhythm, the law of transmutation, you know, four laws of nature, gravitation, matter, and light, you know, the the law of mentalism, the laws of correspondence, the law of vibration, the law of uh, polarity, the law of rhythm, the law of, of, of cause and effect, you know. So there's universal laws, and most of them are immutable. In other words, folks, we have universal laws. Anywhere from 4 to 12 that we know of. And so if we have immutable universal laws, that can only mean one thing. And that is, if there are universal laws, there must be a law giver. In fact, Scripture does tell us that there is only one law giver and judge who can save or destroy. And we all know who that is. Again, the main point is to hold men without excuse concerning their lawlessness by appealing to the fact uh, that creation itself bears witnesses to the immorality of certain practices. In other words, the knowledge of Elohim's existence and divine majesty is made obvious to everyone uh, by the world that he created. It is in this context that Yahuwah has given the knowledge of morality, not just to the Jews through the scriptures, but to everyone in the world through their written moral code or the design conscience. So then, this obviously becomes the second way that the Gentiles are accountable for their lawless actions. In other words, not only is it plainly obvious that sin is wrong from observing creation, but also through our Elohim created moral code or embedded conscience as well. As an example of someone who knows Yahuwah but does not esteem nor thank him is, if you believe that rape is not wrong or right, but is right or wrong only as a matter of opinion or belief 
according to one's own conscience, then you are denying the power or reference of Allahim. As an example of a good conscience, if you believe that murder or stealing is wrong, not as a matter of opinion, but as a matter of fact, then by default you believe in Allahim through your own conscience. On the reverse side of the coin, Paul also makes a point very clear in Romans 2, verse 23, that having the Torah to rely on for explaining sin for you doesn't make you a sinless person or better than anyone else because it actually makes you more guilty than those living with only the knowledge of the moral law through nature and conscience because by having the written law you are now readily breaking more laws through your knowledge of all the laws given to you. That should be an eye-opener, folks. In other words, living with the full understanding of Yahuwah's laws makes you a worse sinner because those living without the Torah may be breaking most of the laws out of ignorance or unintentionally, but those with the written Torah are not and so are held more accountable for many more sins and therefore in much more need of a deliverer. Wow! Are you catching that? Do you know the true deliverer? All you that are in possession of or living under the scriptures, do you know the true deliverer? Yahushua HaMashiach is his name. The scripture gives us an astounding description of human nature or character. And that we were created in the essence of Elohim, but have sinned and fallen short of the glory of Elohim. Just think about that for a minute. Do we really have any excuse to be lawless jerks, being made in the essence with the shared character of a perfect being? The only thing that will save us is the love and kindness of our Creator. Through the atonement sacrifice of His Son, we should all be thankful that Yahuwah shows mercy and love and kindness to a repenting heart. The truth is that the universal laws of love that Yahuwah wrote in His creation and in our conscience was later written in the Torah as a third witness against us to leave us without any excuse and it was given to us through Moses but the favor and the truth came through Yahushua Mashiach meaning that the way out of the lake of fire which is the second death is through Yahushua Mashiach who is the way the truth and the life we can't obey the law perfectly and so we can't save ourselves no matter how few or how many laws we know about. The universal law of love has been broken by all mankind. Not one, no, not one is without sin. And no matter how good we think we are obeying them, we aren't doing a good enough job to save ourselves. Look to Yahushua, the only one that could obey all the laws and be delivered by his righteousness in us. If in fact you are his, Scripture says, if anyone does not have the Ruach of Mashiach, this one is not his. Once you have the Ruach of the Messiah in you, he will help your inner being obey the laws, but you will have a daily battle with the mind of the flesh or the outward man. But fear not, your inner man can overcome the flesh because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Please understand something. This is very important. And that is this. 
Yahuwah loves you with an everlasting love. And he wishes that no one would perish, but all that all would repent and live. For the intense longing of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of Yahuwah. For the creation was subject to futility, not from choice, but because of him who subjected it, in anticipation that the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage to corruption, and to the esteemed freedom of the children of Yahuwah. For we know that all the creation groans together and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only so, but even we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Ruach, we ourselves also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Thank you for watching. Peace and love to everyone. And remember to stay in love with Yahusha. So long, beloved of Yahuwah. So long, Nazarim. Living water, Baruch Haba Bashem Yahuwah. I sing out with praise to you, your name. out with praise to you. My heart desires to honor you, my God. I sing out with praise to you, Yahusha. Baruch Haba,
Hashem.